may be. God did you an underburden, overshadowed with our despised spirit. And I want them, dear God, help them, dear Father, to bend on your word. Dear God, to bring it in a way, Father, that mind could hear, hearts could see. Father, bless each one is our humble prayer. Forgive us if we failed you. Again, we pray and strengthen us to better serve you. I thank you, Lord, and love you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen, indeed. Well, there are a lot of accolades to pass around this morning. Doesn't the sanctuary look pretty? Yeah. Uh, very grateful for that. Thanks to uh, Lois and uh, uh, Paul for doing that. The music was wonderful. Susan, thanks for preparing that so well this morning. Uh, but we, uh, I, I'm always and again impressed with uh, the way Lois does Christmas and Thanksgiving and other things as well. But these, these are my two favorites. Very grateful for, for all of you being here and being, uh, staying well. Uh, our Timmy is a little uh, under the weather this uh, today. We told him, Marilyn, uh, we prayed for him this morning. Uh, I figured he needs all the prayer he can get. <laughs> I don't know how you possibly got here this morning without him guiding you. It must have been tough. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the last several weeks, we have been talking about aspects of growing by faith through experience with God. In the first week, uh, Grace, we, we talked about uh, what a large part of our faith and trust in God comes from our experiencing God in the midst of trials and challenges and seeing how he comes in and how he rescues us. And when we experience his answers to our prayers, then we learn to have more faith in him and more trust in him from our experiences with him. Uh, when that occurs, then of course we're growing more in love a relationship with God and, and we can more easily hear his voice when we're in that love relationship. We talked about that this morning in Bible study. And then we understand his influence more easily. So obviously the more we experience God, then the more we learn to trust him and the more that our faith grows. So nevertheless, our study today, we're going to understand that our faithfulness in obeying God and following Him by actively supporting the kingdom of God, that's what we've been learning. Uh, supporting not only the kingdom of God, but for supporting the local church, which is an extension of the Lord. And we do that by our active attendance and our financial support, and by being faithful to live our daily lives in honor of God as a child of and we also studied about Peter, people like him. Who, well, Peter would go, of course. He had to get out of the boat. He wanted to walk on the water, but he had to get out of the boat. So we talked about Peter and the other circumstances of people getting out of the safety of their comfort zones and stepping out where they have to trust God and let the Holy Spirit lead them. And folks, if you've never done that, where you've just said, Lord, I can't do this. I've got to totally put it in your hands. When you let go, that's frightening. Grace, you ever zip line? Yes. Oh, Are you scared of heights? No. I am. <laughs> when you zip line, there ain't nothing of you. <laughs> and when I zip lined, I was out in the country, and they had these, up in Arkansas, they have these valleys, you know. You're up here about, you know, 20 feet high when you jump off. But then you go across the valley, now you're 50 feet high. <laughs> when you let go on that zip line, it, it's like it's a whole different experience. When you put yourself in God's hands and say, Lord, I can't do this. It's a whole different experience. When you step out of your comfort zone and the safety of those circumstances that you are like, when you watch Jesus come along and walk beside you and see you through your circumstances, then your faith grows and we have more confidence in what God is going to do for us in the middle of that negative circumstance. But by the end of my zip line, I was hooting and hollering. My last zip line was over a river. It was, it was cool. But then it was over with. So those are all aspects of growing in our faith 
And we do that by spending more time in God's Word and learning how to experience our Lord by our time with Him. And we're going to gain an understanding today that there is value in going through suffering. Bet you're going to look forward to this sermon. Well, frankly, uh, again, that's not going to be one of my favorite ways of growing in my Christian faith. But unfortunately, listen, folks, we live in a world that is controlled, if you will, by, by Satan. He has power and authority within this world. And what does Satan only know what to do? To bring chaos, to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he knows how to do, to bring suffering, to bring tragedy, to bring war. That's all he knows how to do. And look around us. Is that not happening? Are people not in chaos? Right. Do we not hear about war every day on the news? Yes. So we're going to focus on some passages today that are going to help us to get through the understanding. So be on your way to uh, Psalm 27. So we're going to get through this understanding that we are going to suffer because of Satan's influence and control in this world. Yet... What, we, what, what can we as Christians hope to gain out of any suffering? If you will join me, please. Hang on, I'm going to move this. I hear that scratching. Sorry. Now, that should stop. Pardon me. I should have let Sue input that on me. She didn't have it right. Psalm 27, we're going to read the first 11 verses, so if you'll look on, please, Paul put that on the screen if you don't have it in your Bible there. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall uh, seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock, and now my head is will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices and shouts and of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with, with my voice and, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Well, we don't know when David wrote this song. But you can imagine, perhaps, that, that David and his men are trying to hide from his father-in-law, King Saul. And that David is, is not wanting to encounter Saul's soldiers. That's his fellow. He was also a soldier. That was his fellow soldiers. He didn't want to have to kill any of his, his fellow Hebrews. So they're hiding and living in the wastelands of Israel, south of Jerusalem. Yet Saul has spies out looking for David. So wouldn't this psalm be go along the lines of these dangerous circumstances facing uh, David? Now the normal person would be cowering. Saul sent out some of his most elite troops, and then he came as well, trying to find David. And frankly, he was going to kill his son-in-law. But this is not a lament psalm that you're hearing from David. Rather, it's quite the opposite. This psalm is a psalm of praise and adoration to God in the midst of the danger that David is feeling in the, in the midst of his negative circumstances. Look on the screen and you'll see there uh, the caves in, the, in this area of the desert. And he says that, that God is his light. Well, in, inside a case, it, it, is it dark? 
you can't see, you stumble and fall over this, uh, the stalag, uh, mites that are on the floor. In the darkness, doesn't light bring joy and confidence and assurance when you're in darkness, when the lights go out in the middle of the night? Then David says that God is his salvation. We all know uh, what the religious definition of salvation is, but if you cast out, if you were, if you were going down a river and you fell over into the, into the river, Grace, if you were over in Colorado or somewhere in one of those rapids, would your salvation be maybe the boat or, or a log or, or even a rock? That would be your salvation. What, when Jeremiah was dumped into that, that, that uh, dry uh, pit and he sunk down to his arms and he was going under in that mud and all of a sudden somebody threw a rope down to him. That rope was his salvation. So David calls God a defense for him in the midst of being searched for in the wilderness. Saul was trying to take his life, but David says, God is a defense for my life. Therefore, whom shall I dread? Whom shall I fear? Because God is on my side. Now, Brother John, I'm not a prophet. I don't try to pretend to be a prophet. But I suggested to them in Bible study this morning, I'll be surprised if, if we're still here in 25 years. I'll, I'll, be, led, I'll, be, I'll be surprised even if we were here in 10 years. I believe we're near the end of, of, of our time on this earth, though the Lord is going to take us out of here. And I think between now and that time, we're going to see more and more corruption in government. We're going to see prices increase. We're going to see a global calamity of some side sort of end. Now, that's just me talking. But we need God on our side. We need to know that he is our defense, that he is our shield, that he is our salvation. He is our rock, our hope, and we can grab onto him in the midst of our struggles. And in verse 2, whenever David's adversaries and enemies come for him, what does he say? God's going to make them stumble because God is my defense. He is my light. He is my salvation. And in verse 3, It wouldn't even matter if he was surrounded by his enemies because God is his defense and salvation. Therefore, his heart will not fear because he is confident in the Lord his God. And in verses 4 and 5, David says that he wants to be in the house of the Lord where he can enjoy the beauty and the joy of meditating in God's word. And existing in the presence of God. Now, church family, you can exist in the presence of God at your house. I know that. I'm grateful for you being here. Because when we come together, we bring the Holy Spirit into this sanctuary. And we pray and we invite the presence of God to be around about us. It's just a different kind of experience to be in the presence of God with other fellow believers. And besides that, when times of troubles do come, then God is going to conceal David. God can help us. See, we've been praying this morning for Tim and for, and for, uh, and for, for Dwight and Kim and Candy and, and so forth, the others. Uh, Nancy, we even pray for you. We, we, that's what a church family does. We bring the presence of God into people's lives by praying for them and asking God's care and help. And so David is saying that even, even there, I, God will conceal me and he will camouflage me for my enemies and they'll pass right by me and they'll not see me because he's got me. Instead, God is going to lift him up, he says, and he's going to put him higher than his enemies on a rock, not on dirt, not on mud, on a rock, a firm foundation. And then, and then who will have the advantage when you're up, when you're up higher in your fighting? You've seen enough sword fights. You know what that what means. You have the advantage. You have more power casting down. So I want you to see some keys here. Look up here in verses. Uh, is there another one? It's four, five, and I'm going to look, look at four, five, four, five, and eight. Is there another one? 
Yeah. I want, to, I want you to see there in 4, 5, 8, and, and you won't be able to see 9, right? 8 and 9. But when David gets to enjoy the beauty of, the, of, of God, well, that's a question. When, when does David get to enjoy the beauty of God? When he's in the house of the Lord. When he's meditating on the word of God. And when David seeks the face of God. Church family, I, when I come down here and I stand here waiting at the time of invitation... I know who I'm speaking to. I know that all of you are Christians. But you know sometimes there's things that we need to talk about. Maybe you want to come to me and, and we pray for some circumstance. But, or, or you can call me at 2 o'clock in the morning. Sue Hannah Lynch is going to talk with you. <laughs> if you have a need, I want to go with you and seek the face of God. That's why I say you can sing with, with Susan and and. and and what's his name? Uh, or you can pray. You can pray. Seek the face of God. How beautiful is that, right, Brother John? So when we seek God's face, what does that mean? It means we, when we seek his face, we, we do so boldly or humbly. We humbly come before God, approaching God, seeking his favor, seeking his mercy. And it means that we desire his presence and that we want to be assured of God's favor by our right standing with him. But our right standing involves not only what we do here in church, but what we do where? At home, in our daily life, in our daily time that we spend with God. We can't, you can't just spend a few minutes, with, in, in, an hour here in church and, and be done. You've got to nurture this. You've got to nurture this. Like you do any other relationship, you've got to nurture that love relationship you have with the Lord. And, and that's what I've said before, that a person can't live the way they want to in the world and they come running up one day and say, Oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. I need your help now. I have this going on with me. Or, Oh, Lord, I've got my wife. She's sick. But I haven't gone in your church in five, six, seven years, Lord. But I think about you every now and then. The Lord has to spend time correcting them before he can spend time blessing them and moving them forward. You see my point there? That's a serious situation. What you're doing today is nurturing your love relationship with the Lord. Isn't that a special time that you come? So perhaps the reason that a person is seeking God's face is because of their long inattention from the Lord. They, they felt this coldness in the world and now they finally say, I got to get back in church. I got to get back in my love relationship with the Lord. Where do you start? Right here is a great place to start. And right here is the other place Amen. to start. We need the Lord. So that's why at this time on Sunday morning is so important for us to maintain our strength in the middle of troubling times and perhaps medical issues. I hate to say this, Grace. I know you. You, you think your, your, your uh, grandfather's old. He's not. Uh, he's young. He's, just, he's really young, if you're part of the pun. Uh, it, 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 his, his, his mind is still young. His, his body just a little wore out. You know, when you, when you hit 50, things start happening. When you hit 60, things start breaking. When you hit 65, things start falling off. I'm just going to warn you, Susan. It just happens. So isn't it good to know that the Lord is on our side. And as we daily walk with him and spend time with him. And we nurture that love relationship with him. We are able to seek his face and to seek his favor. When we do that we're able to hear God's voice more easily. And we feel his precious comforting spirit wrapped around us. I don't know if this is an appropriate example or not, but it's, it's one that occurred to me. I've told you the story before, and if you don't know it, I'll, you'll hear it again sometime. When my mom was killed in a car accident, um, at her gravesite, uh, at the end of her service, my brothers and I kind of looked at each other, and we all had the same thought at the same time. Hey, you want to sing? And so we did. We, we just led the, the graveside people, and gratefully there was a lot of them, we just broke out in song. 
We led others to sing familiar hymns with us right there because that was our comfort. We knew where our parents were. We, there was no doubt in our mind whatsoever. We knew that they were with Jesus. It broke our heart that we had lost mom and dad before that. But there was joy in the midst of those troubling times because we knew Jesus Christ. We knew the comfort of the Father. So when we see God's face as a child of God, we're able to go up to God and say, Abba, Father, please listen to your child. I have this to say to you, and I have this to ask of you. And he will hear you. He is your Abba, Father. What an incredible privilege we have to reach out to the God of the universe Amen. and call him Abba Father and say, Abba Father, would you pull me up in your lap? I just need to sit in your lap for a little bit and just listen to you. So God is ever watching over us. Those who are righteous and those who are his children, God is ever watching over us. Have a quick verse, just one, uh, just a little ways back in, in Psalm 17, 8. If you want to turn there, or Paul is going to put it on the screen, just one verse. I'd like to read that for you. It's very simple. It says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Lord, keep me as the apple of your eye. Now, there's three or four verses that go all the way back to Deuteronomy. That, that, that use that phrase, Lord, keep me as the apple of your eye. But the Hebrew word there is ishon. And it literally means the pupil of your eye. So the literal meaning of that one verse says, God, please keep the pupil of your eye upon me. Isn't that a wonderful prayer? Now, Paul is going to put some other verses up on the screen for us. And, um, and if you'll look up there on the screen, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read these for you. 1 Peter 3, 12. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Go ahead. Luke 12, 4 through 7 says this, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that no more of that can be done, can they do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Lord, shall the Son of Man, also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven. Next, please. In Luke twenty-two sixty-one, 61, the Lord turned and, said, and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. And he said, he told him, before a rooster crow today, you will deny me three times. The Lord knew. The Lord knows our hearts. The Lord knows our hearts. Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Psalm 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. Next. And then Job. Does he not see my ways? That's a question. And number all my steps? He's talking about God, of course. Yes, he does. So, I, I know, uh, Sue, you have a history of keeping children. If you had a nine-month-old in the floor, nine-month-old loves to bite on every toy, lick every toy, pick up every bug, and, and, and taste of it. 
If you have a nine month old in the floor crawling around, you're going to keep your eyes peeled on that baby when you let them loose in the house. And, and we're going to keep a very close watch on that baby while they're crawling around. That's what God does for us. He keeps his eyes on his children, and he numbers their steps, and he even knows the hairs of their head. God, thank you for that. So listen to me. Here we go. So fear serves as a false wet blanket to our faith growing. Fear is an uncontrolled emotion that has not been surrendered to God's will and work in our lives. It is a false wet blanket. We live in a world where Satan has power. And of course we're going to have troubles. But what did Jesus say? Look up there. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I want to do one last passage with you. Joshua 9. Again, uh, Paul will put that on the screen for us. But Joshua 1, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Pardon me. Chapter 1 of Joshua. What is that? The 5th book? 6th book? Joshua Judges. Let me read there. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and your uh, people to the land which I am giving you, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which this, the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and from this Lebanon, even as far as the great rivers, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you in all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you. Or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. So that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Church family, I know some of you in here are cancer survivors. I know some of you in here have loved ones that you watch go off to the armed forces. I know some of you in here have medical issues that come and go. And some of you in here have had tragedy envelop you. So by no means am I making light of the suggestion that no matter what you have come in your life, you've got to be strong. I'm not saying that. We're all human. But when we do face those trials and situations... I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm telling you, I'm encouraging you, I'm trying to share with you that you can keep your faith strong if you will do that before you get in that situation, before you get in that dark place of trouble, then you have time to develop that love relationship with the Lord. Because I want you to be in that precious place so that you are the apple of God's eye and that you know that your uh, Abba Father is going to take care of you. One of the people that have suffered the most that in Christian faith that we uh, know uh, that, that we're very familiar with in our lifetime is Corey Tim Boone. She has said this on the screen. I have experienced his presence in the deepest hell that man can create. I have, I, I have really tested the promises of the Bible and believe me, you can count. And Matt Slick is a Christian writer. He says this beautifully. In the face of any threat, we can be of good courage because the Lord himself is with us. And he is worthy of our trust. No night is so long, no darkness so impenetrable, no suffering so painful, no evil so frightful, 
and no enemy so fierce as to disturb the confidence of the one who has God for his light and the Lord for his salvation. Believers can be of good courage and not be afraid because the Lord is the stronghold of their lives. Church family, we are worthy because we are a child of God. And we have a Heavenly Father who loves us and wants to bless us, but we have to let Him. First of all, by obeying Him and making our lives open for His blessing and care to us, rather than having to receive His correction. And then secondly, He wants to use us for His glory and to bless us for His good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you. We, we are so grateful for your magnificent loving kindness. You are perfect, you are honorable, you are magnificent. You are our shelter, you are our hope, you are our rock, you are our fortress, you are our strength, you are our hope, you are our joy. Hide us in the shadow of your wings. Hide us in the refuge on a high hill from our enemy Satan. Fill us with your holy self and let us know and experience your love so that in all of these things we can always give you praise and thanks and adoration. So we surrender ourselves to you corporately right now in Jesus' name. Come and use our lives. Give us confidence and hope, understanding and strength. Build up our faith as we walk with you every day. For those that we've been praying for that, have, that are sick today and have needs and concerns, we, have, we put them back before you right now in Jesus' name. And thank you for your answers. Christ we pray.